Um, so let's, let's go ahead and start. I want to welcome everybody. I'm Charles Shapiro, the President of World Affairs Council. Um, I invite you to turn on your cameras if you'd like. Um, this is a members forum, and so it's a smaller group, uh, and the idea is to have discussion. If you don't want to turn your cameras on, if you don't want us to see you in your in your sweatsuit or whatever, uh, that that's okay as well. Or you know, you need to clean up your den and you forgot to. That's cool. Hey, Amanda's waving. Jag's waving. Hello, everybody. Gene, how are you? Um, Dorothy Beasley's on from Savannah, so we're we're in two states and multiple cities. There's Michael Mudler eating his lunch. Um, the, the program today um, is on covert military operations strategy versus legality. It's with Dr. Laurie Blank from Emory University and Dr. Carrie Lee from the U.S. Air War College in Montgomery. Um, I'm going to introduce Carrie, who's then going to introduce Laurie, and Carrie is going to be the, the, the moderator, the questioner, and, and, and Ari Blank is going to be the, the smart answerer of those questions. It'll keep us all intrigued. Um, Carrie Lee spoke at the World Affairs Council, I'm trying to remember, must have been a year and a half ago, maybe, something like something that. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and you drove up to Atlanta for it, and so this is a lot easier. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you coming to Atlanta and speaking to us. She's assistant professor at the Air War College in International Security Studies with a PhD from Stanford. Your thesis was in the politics of military operations, which is, that must have been great, I guess it wasn't fun writing, but uh, <laughs> what a great topic. Um, and she's got an SB from MIT in political science, and I'm trying to figure out why somebody goes to MIT for political science, but cool, that's great, you know. Uh, that's a, a long and sorted story. Okay, good. We can, <laughs> we can talk about it another time. So, uh, Carrie, let me turn this over to you. One, one thing, though, is you see the – this is a little Zoom instruction for people like me who just figured this out this morning. If you're on your laptop and you see the participants button on the bottom bar, if you click on that, all the participants show up on the right-hand side. Okay, and then down at the very bottom right hand corner, there's a button that says raise hand. And if you click on that, it'll raise your hand electronically. And Carrie will know to call on you. That, that sound cool? So Carrie, you need to do this as well. So you see who's got their hand raised. Yes. Carrie and Laurie are gonna talk for 25, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, whatever you feels right, and then Please leave loads of time for questions from the, from the audience because we're going to have loads of questions for you. So over to you, Dr. Carrie Lee. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Charles, for having me here and, uh, and for hosting this. I'm really excited. This is a, a great topic and I'm thrilled to uh, introduce our, our kind of guest uh, speaker, uh, Professor Lori Blank. Um, she's a clinical professor of law at Emory University and specializes in international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, international criminal law, and national security law. She's also a co-director of a multi-year project on military training programs in the law of war and co-author of Law of War Training Resources for Military and Civilian Leaders. So she's really just the perfect person to, to have come speak to us about covert military operations and um, kind of legal, legality versus strategy. She got her JD from the New York University School of Law uh, and, and has an MA in International Relations from Johns Hopkins University, SAIS, and uh, an AB in Political Science from Princeton University. Um, on January 3rd, the Trump administration made international headlines with the targeted killing of top Iranian general and Quds Force leader Qasem Soleimani. The administration claimed that the killing was necessary for self-defense as he was in the midst of planning an imminent attack on Americans and also served as a warning to the Iranian government that additional Iranian interactions against US forces in Iraq would not be tolerated. The episode, however, raised much bigger questions about the nature and the purpose of covert more operations more generally and how we as Americans balance both the laws of war and the occasional need for a military action in uh, essence of security. 
And so I'm thrilled that Professor Blank is able to join us today to discuss the strategy and legality of covert operations. And I'll turn it over to her for some introductory remarks. Okay, well, thank you very much, Carrie. And um, thank you to Charles and World Affairs Council. Um, I, I would normally say I'm very happy to be here with you all. So I, I guess I'm happy to be in, in the digital world with you all today. Um, and especially on such a beautiful day. So uh, um, I appreciate you all joining us. So I thought um, I would take a few minutes first to do a little stage setting um, before we dive into um, talking about the Soleimani strike in particular. I thought it would be useful first to just get us all on the same page as it were in terms of what do we think about when something like this happens and we want to think about the legal issues involved. Um, so let me just take a couple of minutes on that and um, just build the, the groundwork for that conversation. So anytime that we're talking about the US using force, which obviously is what happened here, um, we, we sometimes may have questions about whether or not an action is using force, but in general, anytime something goes boom, um, that's a pretty obvious uh, answer to that question. So if we're thinking about that question, within the context of the United States, we're looking at two broad questions, domestic law authority and international law authority. Both are relevant, both are important, and you actually have to satisfy both. Um, you can't use one as a substitute for the other. And so uh, very quickly, if we're talking about domestic law, we're talking about the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States decides um, and sets forth the framework in our separation of powers system for understanding when the president can take a particular action. Um, that's the domestic law question when we're thinking about using force is which branch of government did took this action and did they have the authority? So in this case, it's the executive branch. Um, that's usually where we end up having these questions. And in general, what the constitution sets out is that Congress has the power to declare war. Um, and so in general, when we think about the authority to use force to go to war, we start by thinking about Congress. However, it's not limited to Congress because our constitution um, is much more nuanced and, and creative than that. And so there is a space for the president, the executive branch to um, take action in this area. And in particular, the president has the authority under Article Two of the Constitution to take unilateral action in defense of the nation um, to repel or defend against an attack. So anytime we're thinking about the domestic law question um, and the president took action to use force, um, as in this case, for example, we are asking two questions. One, did Congress authorize it? And if Congress did, then we would look at that authorization and say, okay, does the thing that happened fit within what Congress authorized? Kind of a fairly classical, like statutory legal analysis there. If Congress did not authorize it, or if Congress authorized something, but the thing that happened doesn't fit into that something, then we ask the next question and say, could the president do this without Congress? And anytime we're asking the question of whether the president could do this without Congress, we're looking at Article Two of the Constitution, which of course is where the president's powers are enumerated. And that comes down to the question of whether or not the president was taking action to defend or repel, defend against or repel attacks. Over the last, uh, few decades, there has been a remarkable expansion of presidential authority in this space. And so we often will see arguments made that the president can use force in order to safeguard other important national interests. Um, as you can guess, that is um, a concept that is hard to uh, constrain. Um, so it's interesting to see how that has evolved over time. So that's our domestic law uh, framework in a very small nutshell. So what about international law? 
Because the domestic law question is about which branch of government did this and did that branch of government have authority under the constitution? The international law question is about could the country, the United States, take this action? International law is not really that concerned with the internal dimensions of who did it and it's so on and so forth. It's concerned about was it okay to engage in this forceful action in the first place. And so international law has a basic presumption, a starting point, which is that it is prohibited for one state to use force against another state in its territory, against its political independence, its sovereignty, et cetera. That's our starting point. Okay, that's the basic structure of the UN Charter agreed to um, in the aftermath of World War II, uh, in the aftermath of two world wars um, over the course of 30 years or so. And that was really the goal of the UN was, as it states in the preamble of the UN Charter, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Well, if you wanna limit the resort to war, if you wanna save people from the horrors of war, the best way to go about doing that is to make it very hard to go to war. Right, to limit the legal options for when you can go to war. So that's what the international law framework does. It says, basic starting point, you're not allowed to use force against another state. That's a good starting point. Um, then we have some exceptions, because if that was the rule, um, we can all imagine that would not be an easy rule to follow. There would be many situations in which a state would say, we're facing an existential threat, we're facing this, that, or the other thing, we need to use force, so um, we're going to throw that rule out the window. When you throw rules out the window, um, that has a rather corrosive effect on the rule of law overall. So we have three exceptions to this prohibition. The first one is sort of a long-standing, what we would call a customary exception, so it's not listed in a treaty anywhere, and that is consent. So if the state where you're going to use force said, sure, okay, or hey, could you come help us? Um, then you're allowed to do that. That's fine. You have an invitation, you have consent, et cetera. A uh, couple examples, in uh, 2014, Iraq basically picked up the phone, called the United States and said, uh, this ISIS group, really a big problem. We can't stop them. Could you help us? And the US began bombing and attacking ISIS and trying to push them back within Iraq that's the US using force with consent. Same thing with Russia using force in Syria. Around the same time, Assad called up Putin, same thing. Key, these uh, rebel forces, ISIS, this whole civil war, it's not going that well for us. We could use a little help. And in came their friends, the Russians. So those are some examples of consent, right? And we can think about that a little bit when we talk about the Soleimani strike. Then there's two exceptions that are set out in the UN Charter. The first one is if the UN Security Council authorizes the use of force. This doesn't happen that often. It was the idea when the UN Charter was founded that in fact, that would be the way this collective security system would operate, right? That countries would get together. Oh my gosh, there is this major threat to international peace and security. We agree something needs to be done. Let's do it. Um, I always figure that someone somewhere in the universe had a sense of humor because within just you know, a few hours of the UN Charter coming into effect, we have the beginnings of the Cold War and the US and the Soviet Union couldn't agree on anything. Um, and so we've rarely had examples of the UN Security Council voting to authorize the use of force because we don't have the political um, structure, right? In terms of the members of the UN Security Council to be able to have that happen. We had a brief window in the early 1990s and now we're back to sort of the I say black, you say white uh, nature of things right now between the US and Russia. So that's UN Security Council authorization. The final one, which is always the most interesting, uh, the most commonly referred to, um, and the, the one that kind of triggers the most legal analysis is self-defense. So if a country is the victim of an armed attack, it can use force in self-defense in order to repel or deter that attack. That includes an imminent armed attack, right? And that means you are literally about to absorb an attack. You don't have to take the first blow. You can use force to stop that attack from coming. 
um, because it, again, the law wouldn't make sense if it said you have to absorb the first punch before you do anything to defend yourself. So um, there are a variety of additional criteria and requirements when using force in self-defense. Um, besides there actually being an armed attack or imminent armed attack, your use of force has to be necessary, meaning you can't forestall this attack or, or deter it in any other way. And the force you use has to be proportionate to the objective of ending or deterring the attack, right? So you have to use the force that is to the nature and degree for achieving that objective, not more. So that's our basic framework. Um, if you were to say on January 1st or the morning of January 2nd, okay, I know this big thing is gonna happen. Quick, let me just make sure I have all the law in my head so I know when this big thing happens, how to understand it. Um, so that's our, our starting point right there. Um, so let me now, um, drop all of the events of January 2nd, January 3rd, I think up through about January 8th um, into this equation. And how do we think about this particular event, which you know is so interesting that as of mid-January, um, I think folks in the national security establishment would have put this up as like a major, major national security event of 2020, um, which feels so quaint now. Um, at this point. And I think we've all even forgotten that you remember there were those really big fires in Australia all through January. We've kind of forgotten about that as well. Um, okay, so how do we think about the killing of Soleimani? And so let's start from the domestic law perspective. The president ordered the strike, right? This was not, he didn't go to Congress and say, Okay, I think this is really important, blah, blah, blah. Would you please pass an authorization to use force for this occasion? That didn't happen, we know that. Okay, so the president used his unilateral, made a unilateral decision. Okay, so the first question is, well, did the president have the authority to do that? And we can go through that same analysis and say, well, did Congress authorize this? So my quick answer is no. Um, we can have a little debate and there have been some at least even attempts by the administration to suggest that existing congressional authorizations did in actually encompass this use of force. I think those are stretching the analysis a bit beyond repair. Um, the 2001 authorization to use military force, which was the response to 9-11, um, it authorized the use of force against nations, individuals, organizations that were the perpetrators of 9-11, supporters, uh, harbors, etc. cetera. Um, I don't think there's any way to fit this particular uh, uh, Soleimani and the Quds Force, et cetera, into that authorization. And the administration really did not attempt to. Um, if they did, it was really a throwaway, like, Ah, we just got this pile of authorizations to use force, so let's just throw them all at the, at the argument. The one that at least was attempted was the 2002 authorization to use military force against Iraq, which was passed in the fall of 2002 and was the source of authority for domestic authority for the invasion of Iraq in March of or February of 2003, and. Again, this is really a stretch because what that resolution authorized was the use of force to defend US national security against the threat posed by Iraq and to enforce relevant UN Security Council resolutions against Iraq. It's a very tenuous argument to say that um, the threat posed by Qasem Soleimani and his Quds Force, which is an Iranian force that was surely operating in Iraq, but at various times, that that fell within an authorization to use force to defend against a national security threat posed by Iraq. Not posed by events in Iraq, posed by Iraq. So that's a tough argument to make, and I don't think it ever gained any real traction. 
So that, that leaves us to the question of, okay, well, then the president did this by himself. Did he have the authority under Article 2? And here we get to the big challenge all the time when we try to apply law to any operations like this, which is, well, I only have the facts that have been reported in the newspaper or on the news or maybe in a blog. I actually, I actually don't have all the facts. None of us have all the facts because we're not privy to um, any classified information. And we're certainly even not even privy to just all of the information, even if it wasn't classified, that was being used to make this decision. So I throw that out as a very big caveat to begin with. So um, what's interesting is the authority under Article 2 of the Constitution that the president has to act on his or her own is to repel attacks and defend against an attack. So um, at the beginning, what we heard from the administration was that this was to prevent imminent attacks by that Soleimani was planning. We didn't get any information about what those attacks were, how imminent they were, where they might be, what they might be against. It was a constantly changing story, which um, I think for me and for many, many others left us uh, decidedly unsatisfied by that argument. Um, it kind of came across to me at the time as I really, we, we really wanted to do this. It was a target of opportunity. We could get him right now. So he's just a really bad guy, no doubt. Bad guy, for sure. But bad guy is not a legal argument, much as we might like it to be. Um, and so it's, it's hard to know at the time. Interestingly, subsequent to that, sort of over a period of weeks, we began to see a bit more sophisticated version of this argument, which was that in fact, the U.S. had suffered attacks by Iran and Iranian proxies. This uh, Khatib Hezbollah and some other forces in Iraq. And so, in fact, the U.S. was responding to existing attacks. Now we, we have a little bit more meat for this argument. If that's the case, then, then the president does have a pretty solid claim under constitutional law. Um, that's different from whether it was wise right, which I think we may come to. So that's the domestic law, right? We're, we're not entirely sure, but maybe there's some hooks to grab onto. Um, international law, we don't have consent from Iraq. In fact, Iraq was quite unhappy with this decision. And we clearly don't have a UN Security Council authorization to do this, so we can sweep those aside fairly quickly. And we get to the question of self-defense. And again, this rests on the facts. If in fact the situation was as it first appeared that Soleimani, you know, sort of had these wicked plans to engage in attacks against the US or US forces at some future date and in some locations and we didn't know where, but we just knew, you know, he just had nefarious malicious intent. That doesn't really satisfy what international law thinks of as self defense, because this is supposed to be a last resort. If the idea of using force and self-defense becomes too loose, then we have really undone the whole purpose of having a legal framework to minimize and limit the resort to force. We don't want it to be too easy. If, on the other hand, the US was responding to a series of attacks that had happened over the space of a few months, now we get into a different story. Well, we probably have satisfied that initial trigger of an attack, but now we have to think about whether or not killing Soleimani and uh, the, the head of uh, Khatib, the other, the Iranian, uh, the proxy group, the militia group was necessary in order to repel or prevent these attacks and whether it was proportionate. Um, my best, my best way of answering that is it could have been. <laughs> I just, I don't have all the facts, right? It's certainly a reasonable way to think about it, except for the fact that just killing the leader of a group doesn't tend to stop the group from engaging in its activity. It's not like Soleimani was the only one who, he just had all these plans in his head and on the day of a particular attack, he would reveal them all. And nobody shared his intent or his goals or his plans or his 
activities. That's a bit far-fetched. So to imagine that this was the only way to stop the attacks, it's certainly possible, but it's hard to know. Um, for me, as a last piece in thinking about the Soleimani strike in terms of um, what's, what was troubling in thinking about the legal analysis was the inability or unwillingness of the administration to provide a careful legal analysis from the beginning, which even if later on you can put one together, that failure at the beginning or unwillingness left for me a bad taste in my mouth as there wasn't one and they built one afterwards. Um, I don't know if that's the case, but that's sort of how I, I felt at the time. So thank you so much, Professor Blank. Um, I'm going to start us off with a, with a couple of questions and then open it up to, to hand raises. Um, I know Ambassador Shapiro, you are, you are first on my list. Uh, so, but I thank you for, for putting Suleimani into, into this kind of legal framework and walking us through it. Um, my question here is, um, given that we have covert operations, we don't always have all the facts that are public, right? And, and in a democracy, it's important that we hold leaders accountable, right, for actions both domestically and abroad. Um, so what are, the, what are the ways in which we can, or we are supposed to hold leaders accountable for, for actions as a public um, in light of the fact that so many of these covert operations, including Soleimani, need to be kept secret and may need to be kept, kept classified in the interest of national security? Yeah, so this is a, um, these are, are difficult questions. And I want to, I think we should separate out um, operations. So we, we can think about sort of a scale, right? On, on, one, on one end of the scale, we think about um, military operations where there's sort of this steady drumbeat for months um, in which the administration is building support. Like think about the 2003 invasion of Iraq. There was a campaign domestically, essentially, to get authorization, to get the public behind the idea, to get Congress to authorize it. So in essence, the, the government, the administration is doing the opposite, right, of what we would think of in the covert space. It's literally trying to build support. So that would be kind of one end of the spectrum. Then we have things more like, um, uh, let's even, there's a space where we have actions kind of like the Soleimani strike, where the government does something, um, the whole world sees it. It's pretty hard not to see that happen or that it's immediately reported on. And the government um, accept, takes responsibility or, or is very clear that the US is the one that did that. But um, it didn't tell anyone in advance. Um, it doesn't share an enormous amount of information about the thinking, the reasoning, et cetera. We can move along that to something where the US does something, people see that it happens, but the US never takes, it has a deniability, right? Plausible deniability to it. And it's like, well, we think that that was the US, but, but we don't know. And then we have things where literally, the, the, and other countries obviously too, the government does something, nobody knows it happened. The government doesn't take response, right? There's many things that go on where governments seek to uh, gain influence, um, influence things that are going on, but they don't want anybody to know even that the thing they're doing is going on, right? So we have this whole spectrum. So I think for the purposes of, of this conversation to stay in that middle space, um, because in terms of the truly covert, um, that's obviously extraordinarily difficult to discuss until years later. Um, and then we end up, we have rules on oversight and things like that. But in this sort of space where we know something happened, um, but it's kind of hard to get the information about it, um, the government has a monopoly on the information. That's really the challenge here. The, the public has facts that can be reported on. Um, a missile struck this car. These are the people who were in it. They died. It happened at this time. Um, and then they can, we get more facts like the missile came from a US fighter jet or a drone, et cetera. 
Um, but, but we don't actually have any of the facts about the threat, about the reason for the attack. And we essentially are in the position of, we have to believe or not believe the government. And that happens all the time. This is not, uh, you know, a strange circumstance. And so it does make it challenging because it's quite hard to advocate and analyze when you don't have all the facts and when um, the government, reasonably so, I mean, not even thinking that the government is trying to hide anything, the government can say, um, look, there was a big threat. I just can't tell you how I know. And I can't tell you the full nature of it because if I do, I'm going to reveal sources and methods. And nobody wants sources and methods to be revealed because that's how intelligence operatives get killed. That's how you lose access to your, to your pipeline of intelligence information. Obviously, that's, that's a big problem. So it it's really raises some, some interesting challenges um, in this regard. I think one of the reasons that we have some rules on um, how the president shares information in this regard um, is to help ensure that we do retain the ingredients of an engaged citizenry and an engaged legislative body on these areas. So, for example, under the, um, the structure of the War Powers Resolution, the president needs to report to Congress within 48 hours of any activity um, that triggers those reporting requirements. So basically the US um, either being involved in or being in a place where it's likely to be involved in hostilities, kind of simplifying the, the rule there. Um, and so actually the president did. The president did submit a report to Congress within 48 hours after the strike. But interestingly, the report's classified. Normally, these things are not classified. Normally, when the president transmits uh, a letter under the War Powers Act to Congress, it may have a classified annex, but the basic, here's what happened and here's where our authority to do it comes from, is unclassified. Here, I think this may have been the first time, I'm not sure, it was all classified. So Congress could see it, but Congress can't engage in public on it. So we saw, um, even after some of the briefings, we saw some members of Congress um, who were quite disappointed in the administration's briefings, but you saw they couldn't really exactly say why, because it was a classified briefing, right? So they could say it was insufficient, uh, blah, 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 but they couldn't tell us more. The, by keeping everything classified in that manner, also the public can't engage, we cannot engage our elected officials on these issues as well. So there is a, there is a, essentially like a societal compact almost in terms of some amount of information, some amount of transparency that enables us um, to, to do this well. Another, I guess one other piece that's important here is the lack, at least for a while, and there's still not much, the lack of any substantial and substantive um, legal discourse from the administration about this uh, is, is really, I think, handicaps the broader discourse about these questions. If, um, because each time we, we, the US engages in military operations, each time the president uses force, that's another um, brick sort of in the structure in the foundation of how we understand this constitutional analysis, the separation of powers, when the president can use force, the role for Congress, et cetera. The, the, the value of historical precedent is critically important here. Presidents will always rely on historical precedent to say, well, presidents have done this before. If we don't know the true legal analysis here, we can't really understand the value of it as precedent and whether it's changing the analysis from the past and what that means uh, in terms of being prepared for the future. Thank you, Ambassador Shapiro, uh, the honor of the first question. Thank you, I mean, just, I, I mean, I would argue that, uh, that this, people don't care. Um, I hate to say this, uh, I mean, Congress is not, except for, 
can't think of his name, Senator from Virginia, who is uh, really believes the U.S. should declare war, and Rand Paul. I mean, Congress really posed no objection in this case. Um, we haven't declared war since 1941. We've had uh, war powers resolutions, Gulf of Tonkin, and then for the Iraq war. Um, both of those turn out in retrospect have been based on flawed information. And I'm gonna argue that in November, 2020, um, this is not gonna be a salient issue in the election. I mean, it's a, a, a great topic to talk about intellectually, but I think it has no, I mean, no one seen the, the objections to this, you know, disappeared after a couple of news cycles, did they not? Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. Um, Congress has generally abdicated its responsibility in this space for a few decades now. Yeah. Um, Congress did pass a resolution and I, I started looking to make sure I was up to date on where it was, but Congress passed a resolution, I think it was in March, um, or maybe it was February, um, pre prohibiting the president from using force against Iran without congressional authorization. Um, so that, given what Congress has done in the past, was actually a reasonably bold move by the mm -hmm. Congress. Um, we have, for the last almost 20 years, um, lived in the environment of um, an authorization to use military force, the one in 2001, um, in response to a, a real, like, you know, the 9-11 attacks, major, major, sure. major attack. Um, Congress passed an authorization to use force that is, um, it, even when it was drafted, it was quite broad. It has been read and applied to be um, almost infinite in its capacity. It was actually, what President Bush asked for was broader. <laughs> President Bush basically asked for an authorization to use force, you know, against terrorists everywhere. And Congress at mm -hmm. least tied it to the 9-11 attacks. But the way that it has at least been able to morph and, and develop and evolve over time, um, I think is uh, reminiscent of President uh, LBJ's comment about the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which some of you may be familiar with, um, just to, to add a little color into our conversation. Um, what LBJ said about the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was, it's like grandma's nightshirt, it covers everything. Um, and so the 2001 AUMF has essentially operated that way. Every time the government has wanted to use force against anybody who could potentially be called a terrorist in any way, anywhere around the world. They just have to go 2001 AUMF, um, and it seems to fit within that. So we're living in that space right now already, right? And we're also living in a space where presidents have um, asserted, established, and been able to at least, if not defend, um, proceed with a very expanded authority under Article Two of the Constitution to use force. Um, from a constitutional perspective, um, there's a lot of risks with this. There's a reason the Constitution sets up things the way it does, um, which is to what what the founders wanted to do was to clog the route to war. They wanted it to be hard for the government government to go to war. They didn't want it to be a decision of one person. They thought if we put 400, 500, now 535 um, members of Congress in the path of any decision to go to war, that would mean we would only go to war when it was really necessary. There's something to be said for that. Um, we are no longer really in that space anymore. Um, does anybody in the US really care besides um, constitutional law scholars, a few senators, um, advocacy groups, uh, national security folks, um, among the general population? Not really. Not really. And I would say for a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, there's a broader uh, concern of just a lack of civic education in this country so that I'm not sure 
what percentage of Americans um, are able to identify this development as a problem, that as it being different from what the Constitution originally was envisioned to do. So there's sort of that broad systemic problem. Um, but there's also, um, we have been, we have been generally for now since 9-11 operating in an environment in which our enemy loosely defined, right? Um, our terrorist groups that deliberately kill civilians, that maim people, that use human shields, and they get worse and worse and worse. I call it the really, really, really bad actor theory, which is that when your enemy is pick ISIS, right? It's hard to imagine something more horrific than ISIS at the height of its brutality. Um, there were various things that um, the US or other coalition partners, choices that we made, things we targeted, actions that we took that I expected to raise uh, debate and controversy. Not much at all, total silence because ISIS is just so bad that it was like, well, why are we arguing about this nuanced point of law when we're fighting against an enemy that puts people in cages and burns them alive and does many other horrible things. And I think that's one reason why we're not, we also don't care that much. If we had a more controversial enemy in the sense of, you know, it wasn't so clear and this and that, um, that might be fodder for um, a bit more discussion about whether or not uh, the president was authorized to take certain action. Um, you know, when it comes to international law, there just isn't sufficient uh, knowledge among the population. I do think that actually there is an obligation on the president and the government to um, play an educational role in that regard. Um, we don't see that now, um, but historically, if you look at um, the remarks, the speeches of presidents um, explaining why the US is using force in particular situations, you can see that we've had presidents on, you know, from both parties who really take on that role. You look at uh, George H.W. Bush's um, speech announcing that we're going to war with Iraq in 1991. You look at um, President Reagan's remarks um, with Operation El Dorado Canyon, you know, and um, the strikes against Libya. You look at President Obama's remarks on a number of occasions. And what those remarks are doing is really teaching the country, these are the rules and the moral, moral structures and legal structures by which we think about these things. And we're following them here, right? We're actually, we've lost that over the last few years. Um, and I think that's an important role for government to play here. Okay, our next question is going to be from Mr. Uh, Jagdish uh, Sheth. Oh, you need to unmute yourself, Mr. Sheth. Okay. There we go. Oops. I think I'm unmuting, okay. <laughs> Uh, my question is that since U.S. military is present everywhere outside of its own territory, either invited by other nations or something else, if that takes place on any one of the U.S. military presence outside of the U.S. territory, self-defense. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear the whole question. I, I was breaking up. If I don't know, Carrie, if you were able to hear it, you could repeat it for me. You can repeat that. Could you repeat your question? Sure. Since US military is present everywhere in the world, practically, either invited by different governments or patrolling the oceans in some fashion, if there's an attack on one of those vessels, is there a self-defense to attack again? Or in that case, as an empire, I can go everywhere and sort of pretext that there is a problem because my weapons or my military presence is attacked. 
Okay, so I, Brown from an international law viewpoint. Right. So I didn't hear everything, but I think what the question is is given that the U.S. Um, has a extensive military presence around the world, does that essentially um, provide a um, a uh, a pretext, in essence, um, for self defense because the U.S. sort of is in all these places where it might its forces might be attacked? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So legally, um, I mean, under the law, the law says if you are the victim of an armed attack or an imminent armed attack, you can use force in self-defense. The law is not really concerned with um, whether it's a pretext or this or that. That's, it's just, that's what the law is. Now, um, has the U.S. put itself in positions where it might find itself more likely to be attacked and therefore able to respond in self-defense? Sure, <laughs> um, either as an international law or a domestic law matter. Um, let me give you an example. Um, the U.S. during the Cold War had military forces in, and still does in Germany, but right in a number of sort of frontline locations in Europe to from a strategic standpoint to show the Soviet Union, um, hey, we're here, standing solid with our neighbors in Europe, with our NATO allies. So you don't, don't just think you can give punch them without getting us into the game, right? That's the strategic idea, very simplistic way of explaining it. Think about it from the constitutional perspective though. If Russia, or well, then the Soviet Union were to roll over the border and launch an attack in Germany or Poland and US forces are there, it's like a tripwire for constitutional authority to say the US has been attacked, right? So, I mean, it, it, it can function that way. I don't think that the US, um, I don't think the US uh, is, is positioning forces around the world in order to give itself um, a legal basis for self-defense. I think we position our forces around the world based on our strategic objectives. So um, can one take the more cynical view? Um, I guess, I, I just don't, I, I, that doesn't concern me. Okay, Miss Dorothy Beasley. No, there wouldn't be. Ms. Beasley? All right, we'll wait. There we go. Yeah. Dr. Um, Professor Blank, thank you so much for your presentation and everybody else that's in, in so interested in this, that they tuned in. I think it's a very important question. You laid out what appears to be showing that the president acted illegally. That's first. Um, the question is whether, and I think the answer is no, as you indicated, uh, that he was not taken to task by anybody in any legal forum about it. No one legally made a binding uh, just determination that that was illegal or what the consequences would be. If that is the case, then despite what Charles Shapiro said about, well, doesn't matter in the, in the election, maybe not, but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter because it sets a precedent for domestically for our future presidents to do likewise and say, well, you know, the pres President Trump did it under these circumstances and so I can do it too. That weakens the whole uh, curb on this kind of action and internationally as well. Other countries can use this other presidents, other prime ministers can use this then as an example of international law, since there was no uh, problem with it, or no taken to task about it, um, can use it to, to do pre uh, other actions of the same nature. So it seems to me that the problem is a very serious one as a matter of law. That's so, or am I in the wrong position? Um, yes, no, I, I would agree um, pretty much with, with everything you said, and I'm very happy to um, 
it's, it's great to see you, although I, I can't actually see you, but i um, very happy that you're, you're, uh, you're on, the, on this meeting. Um, so yes, I think that um, the concern is sort of an ever expanding um, source of authority or an ever diminishing set of constraints, maybe as a better way to put it. Um, what's interesting here is there, there, there is at least a, a possible and actually perfectly reasonable argument um, that this was lawful. Um, it, it certainly is possible that the US um, was responding to existing attacks. I mean, we know there had been a few attacks on US um, forces or interests. So there very well may be an, an, a legal argument that this was justified in self-defense. Um, the fact that it wasn't made, or if it was made, it was done in such a piecemeal and unconvincing manner um, is what causes me to um, be quite skeptical about it. <laughs> um, what's interesting is um, two years ago, President Trump ordered strikes against chemical weapons facilities in Syria, also three years ago. Those, there's no, like, I can't find any international law basis for those strikes whatsoever. And the administration never asserted one, not at all. So actually that one is even a stronger argument for the point that you're making. Um, what we see is essentially, um, if we look at this all as a big picture, I can find, uh, if I want to be upset by all of this, what appears to be um, a disregard for the value of presenting legal justification and legal rationale, right? Because we have a number of occasions in which um, there has been no effort to put one forth or the effort has been uh, weak and uh, without any sort of commitment, like, oh, this, no feeling that it's important. Um, as a well, systemic a matter, point. I think that's a big, big, big problem. Huge. Now they don't even have to give a justification because there is no challenge of it in a legal form that determines as a matter of law that it was wrong. And that's right. what I'm saying. Right. So you can go, and that means that anybody in the world can do the same thing under international law. That's right. So one of the challenges with international law is um, that we, we have to look more um, more widely and more creatively at um, the manifestation of displeasure, constraints, disagreement, et cetera. Because the international system is a horizontal system of sovereign states. And so there isn't a, a super, as you well know, obviously there isn't some higher enforcement body that just is like, oh, that looked bad. I'm gonna go hold them accountable for this. Um, and um, so instead, we look for a variety of things. Now, could Iran bring the US to the International Court of Justice? Possibly, right? There's a whole host of questions about whether or not that would be feasible. Um, could the UN Security Council issue a statement of uh, condemnation? Well, it could, except the US would veto it, right? So we have a variety of structural reasons. But if the US is considered to be a less reliable interlocutor about international law, it's harder to see that, but that can still be an effect of this kind of um, event. So we may see more of an erosion of confidence than bold statements of condemnation. Frustrating, but nonetheless, you know, we, we, gotta, we gotta live with, with what we have. Um, so. It could be domestic courts, couldn't it? Were they going to the United States Supreme Court as presidential powers issue? Um, yes, but we would need someone who has standing to bring it there. 
and um, it's very difficult for members of Congress to get standing. Um, and in this instance of a one-off strike, it's, I'm hard pressed to come up with a plaintiff that we could imagine. Um, but I bet if I spent some time with some of my students and asked them to be creative, we might be able to, but yes, you're right. This may be one of these where it's just super hard to get, um, you know, the, uh, un, un, um, unbiased, the court or other unbiased, um, entity to make a statement. So we have two questions left and, uh, four minutes. So I'm going to collect them both. The first from uh, Mr. Hanrady, Gene Hanrady, and the other from uh, Mr. William Hoffman. So both of you ask your questions and then uh, Professor Blank, you can, you can uh, answer and, and we'll finish out. I'm ready. Okay. I actually, I actually have two questions. The first question is, if a president violates the constitution by using force without proper authorization, what is the remedy? What are we going to do about it? Is impeachment the only remedy? Second question, what constitutes using force by the United States? Does supporting something like the Bay of Pigs operation or the overthrow of the president of Guatemala, does that count even though we didn't actually use troops, we just provided material support to the troops that did engage in the violence? Okay, and Mr. Henry? Uh, Lori, uh, I spent 20 years in the Army, all of it with uh, Special Forces and Ranger units, and a good bit of time with Black Ops. Uh, in the simplest of terms, and this is more of a comment than a question, uh, I, I see it as we have a target of opportunity, he's a bad guy, let's get him. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, down the road, that man we know would be responsible for the loss of American life. Could be your husband, could be your son, could be somebody in your immediate family. And I think this would pass the front page of the Washington Post news cycle, as you somewhat said earlier. So let me start with that one, um, because I think what you, your comment kind of um, captures what actually happened, um, which is that when questions were raised about the legality of the strike, the answer from the administration tended to be um, exactly as you've put it, bad guy, really bad guy. Nobody, nobody thinks Soleimani was like, oh, well, you know, a tortured person. I, he could have been good. He could have been bad. No, I mean, he was a bad guy. Um, and I don't know without knowing more um, whether or not that the path would have gone on the way you say. Um, but what was so interesting was that the administration's response to was there legal authority to do this? The response was, it was a good idea, right? He was a bad guy and we're saving lives. And that is a compelling argument. It is a, um, I mean, it's not in a judgmental manner. It's a good soundbite. People can understand that. It works really well on the news, in, in, in you know, public discourse, and so on. Um, and it may well be true. I, I, again, I, I just don't know. But even if it's true, the way our system works, we still need the legal authority. Now, if in fact he was planning imminent attacks or responsible for the attacks that happened, then we would have the legal authority. What I am troubled by is the administration's inability to articulate that. Because if it's there, then just say so. Just say it in clean, we, the law is not that complicated. Um, we've got thousands of examples of past administrations making these arguments. Just pull out the word, whoever and drop in Soleimani, like, like it's there. It's not a new recipe that has to be made. So um, I think from a, from a operational, political, strategic standpoint, um, that's what you just said is the argument. Um, now it, you know, there can be arguments on the other side, like it was gonna cause escalation and any, right, there's, there's a flip side to those arguments. 
but they don't get at the law. And that's, I think, what, um, what's troubling because we can't, if we make decisions solely based on, you know, with a disregard, an, uh, a, right, a disregard for the law, meaning we're not considering whether it's, it's lawful or not lawful. Like we're literally just ignoring it. We have a room full of people and the lawyer is not in the room. Um, we've got big, big process problems, if that's the case. Even if in a single instance, it works out okay. And even if in a single instance, you get lucky that you have a legal argument, we, we've got bigger problems in the future. So, so that would be um, my concern in that regard. Um, with respect to the other questions, um, can the U.S. engage in a use of force if it's not actually sending its troops um, under international law? Yes, if you send, um, if you basically send an armed group to do what you want them, what you want to accomplish, um, and you have some operational control over. So it's not just that you gave them weapons and you gave them money, but you actually told them to go do this. You coordinated, you, you in some manner had some operational control and direction, then yes, you are engaging in a use of force, even if it's not your people who are doing it. Um, and that, again, that's kind of a, uh, I would say a common sense way of thinking about it. Um, one thing I, I sort of like to use as a, as a, as a measure of the, the line between providing arms and this greater involvement that would be a use of force is if providing arms to a to a rebel group is a use of force then all countries around the world are using force all the time like that can't actually be the threshold because wow we've got big problems if that's the case um and um the, your other question about what is the recourse against the president um well impeachment obviously is one that's what the constitution sets out as our last resort um, but Congress can um, pass a, a resolution, a statute saying, uh, get out, stop using force, bring the forces home. It can refuse to appropriate money for it. It can um, use the power of the person in a variety of ways. Uh, like, um, gee, we won't fund, put in president's favorite project unless you bring the, for the troops home. Um, we won't approve any of your nominations, right? Congress actually has a lot of levers of power. They don't always use them. Um, and because there's a huge political risk for Congress, right? Imagine Congress refuses to appropriate funds for a military operation. Politically extraordinarily damaging, right? You've got to go tell your constituents, I'm not giving money to our troops who are overseas fighting for something. Right, and that, that's a hard one to swallow. So president can often put Congress in a corner, right, is kind of where things end up. Professor thank Mann, you, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Oh. Cool, I'm, I'm gonna jump in here. I hope I'm on, can y'all? Um, I wanna thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blank. Oh, that was, this was great. Carrie, thank you for being our moderator today. Um, easiest thing I've done all week. <laughs> <laughs> Had an easy week then. Um, anyhow, this, this is great. I've got so many more questions I'd love to ask, and I'm sure lots of other folks do as well. I, I want to thank the people who raised their hands and got their questions in, Bill and Judge Beasley and Dr. Sheth. Um, thank you very much. This is great. We've got some, I got to do a little advertisement here. We've got some great upcoming programs tomorrow we have at noon we have jimmy story who is the u.s charge of the u.s embassy to venezuela which he can explain tomorrow happens to be located in bogota not in caracas it's a virtual embassy on thursday we've got david rennick who is pardon me david rennie mispronounced it, david rennie who's the beijing bureau chief for the economist magazine um, and Robin Kernow from CNN International will be the moderator. Um, 
it's going to be terrific. It's at 11 a.m. So because it's 11 p.m. in Beijing at that time, and that was the, the, the only time we could work out that worked for both of us. So please register for both of those programs next week. We've got on Tuesday, Dr. Mia Bloom from Georgia State on extremists and COVID and how extremists in the Middle East can take advantage of it. Uh, on Wednesday, we've got Ambassador Thomas Pickering, who's spoken at the World Affairs Council before, who is Ambassador of the United Nations, Ambassador to five separate countries, and Under Secretary for Political Affairs at State Department. And what he wants to talk about is Iran. Um, so in a way, it's a continuation of this discussion, but he wants to talk about Iran, Iran sanctions, and COVID-19. Um, and are we missing an opportunity? And then next Thursday, we've got Ed Martinez, who's the president of the UPS Foundation, talking about how UPS is responding to the COVID pandemic. So we got all that lined up. Please register. I want to thank the UPS Foundation for sponsoring this program today in part. I want to thank you, everybody who, who, who was part of this. Um, this is a members forum, so it's for members of the World Affairs Council. Um, thank you very much for being members. Uh, we, like everybody else, are suffering a little bit now because we don't have, um, not doing programs and not, not charging admission for our programs. So if you're a member of the World Affairs Council, please renew your membership. Please think about upgrading your membership. We, this is a time when we need it. And if you'd like to make a donation, please go to our, our um our um, homepage at uh, wackatlanta.org. Love to have you, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. Um, the question I didn't ask, everybody's thinking is, what do you teach your students, these colonels and, and soon to be colonels at the Air War College about this? Um, and, and Dr. Blank at Emory, thank you so much. This, this has been a really engaging hour. Uh, I appreciate it and I hope to see all of y'all tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.